I really enjoy being able to come to congregations and speak and talk about something that I am very passionate about, something that I love doing, um, and that is talking about uh, the Old Testament and what it has to do with our lives today. Uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I was a minister for some 20 years, and for the last 10 years of that, uh, I was working on getting my advanced uh, degrees, which eventually allowed me to come uh, to Oklahoma Christian and to teach. And one of the things that I learned in that process is how important it is for the academy, in other words, the kind of the intellectual side of Bible study, to meet where we live so that it doesn't just sort of stay in encyclopedias, but it actually makes meaning for us uh, today. And so what I have to say tonight and what I'd like to share with you about this very rich book that we know as Deuteronomy is what does it have to do with us? And what does it have to do with our lives? And how can it speak to us in 2018 in a culture and in a context very, very different uh, from the one in which it was uh, originally received. And so what I'd like to do tonight is to give you a frame for looking at the book of Deuteronomy and then talking through the book, highlighting some important places that I believe very powerfully speak to us today. So as we start with the book of Deuteronomy, I'm mindful and very thankful uh, for the songs that we sang, which talk about walking. We walk with the king, and we have a journey to take, and we're on that journey together. Because in the Hebrew world, when we talk about walking, certainly we're talking about physical walking, but we also talk about how we live. To walk with God is to live with God, and how do we do that? What are the principles of living and of walking with God? And as you know, the life of Israel was not an easy one, and their walk with God was a bumpy one. And it was one that even though they were the recipients of the law and the recipients of the ways of God, that not only were they not necessarily, not only were they not obedient often, but the interaction with God was also very, very bumpy. And so I want to take that into consideration as we start thinking about Deuteronomy, which is in the Old Testament a very rich book that has a lot to say to us. One of the things about uh, the book of Deuteronomy is that it's positioned as that moment when the children of Israel are about ready to go into the promised land, that which had been promised to them. And the book of Deuteronomy is essentially a long extended sermon by Moses, where Moses reminds them of what the law is, he expounds on the law, and he's preparing them for their life with God in this new land that God is bringing to them. That's the beginning. At the end, or towards the end of Israel's history, before they go into uh, uh, captivity, towards the end of that, during the reign of King Josiah, something happens. And it's at this point that I'd like to begin our thoughts tonight, because it forms an important frame for thinking through some of what Deuteronomy has, and that is this. And you, I'm sure you know this already, but I just want to bring it to mind, that, that Israel had gotten so far from God throughout their history that the book of the law was actually lost at one point. And it was under King Josiah that the book of the law was found. And we can read about this in 2 Kings uh, chapter 22 and 2 Kings chapter 23. Now this is, I think this is astonishing to think about a law that was God-breathed, God-given, reminded to the people by Moses at the beginning of their walk all of those generations ago. And over time, through lots of cultural shifts and changes and journeying 
and wars and uh, judges and kings, divided nations, all of this kind of stuff that had happened to them over several hundred years, this very important book of the law, which we now know is the book of Deuteronomy, had become lost. And without the book of the law, without that guidance, you can imagine the kinds of things that would happen. In fact, we read about those in the book of 2 Kings. And so at the end of the book, uh, at the end of uh, in Josiah's reign, the book of the law was found, it was given to Josiah, and then the people were gathered together, the book of the law was read, and on the basis of the reading of the law, Josiah made a lot of reforms. And if you go back through your sort of king history of Israel, you know that at least in the south, in the Judean kingdom, there was good king, bad king, right? There was a series of, 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 of kings, and some were worse than others. And Josiah was one of the really, really good ones, uh, probably the last really good king uh, in Israel. Um, but Josiah, based on the reading of the law, made a lot of reforms. And then, of course, then they celebrated the Passover. So what were some of these reforms? Well, if you look down through this list, and this is only a partial list, if you look through 2 Kings 23, you can read the whole list. But I, just, I pulled these out because these have a significance to them. He burned the vessels that were made for Baal and Asherah. And just as a side note, the, you know, Baal was one of the, the gods that Israel liked to worship instead of Yahweh. Asherah was sort of the female counterpart to Baal, and there were high places of worship that had been made all across, both in Israel and in Judah, for Baal, and Josiah burned these down. He took down the idolatrous priests, priests who were supposed to be the ones who mediated between human beings and God, people who were entrusted with the sacrifices, had become corrupt, and he got rid of those. Uh, he broke down houses of male prostitutes, which had been a practice that had grown up around religious places. He destroyed the places of sacrifice to Molech, which is where children were offered in fire. He removed horses, and this is kind of a way of talking about a lot of military buildup that was dedicated not to Yahweh but to the the sun gods. He pulled down Jeroboam's altar at Bethel and if you remember that when the kingdom was divided Jeroboam took the northern kingdom at Bethel and he made two golden calves very much like the story in Exodus. Set up a rival worship site to Jerusalem in the north and from there, idolatry spread throughout all of Israel. And he removed all the remaining shrines in Samaria. So what Josiah did was an attempt to restore right worship in, in what was left of the Israelite kingdom. And he did so because he was moved by the reading of this law. And the thing that you'll notice in what Jeremiah and what uh, Josiah did in response to the reading of the law was focused on getting rid of idolatry. And if, you, if we think about, could we boil down the sin of Israel or what kept Israel from walking with God in the way God had intended? Is there one thing that would sort of encapsulate all of Israel's struggle. And the one thing that comes up in Israel's history, and it's also well articulated in the book of Deuteronomy, is the sin of idolatry. Putting something else, someone else, some other god, some other practice, some other thing instead of God at, at the top. Right? Instead of worshiping God, it was something else. And oftentimes this idolatry was not the exclusive worship of another deity, but it was almost as if Israel was wanting to hedge their bets, right? It's like, well, we're going to worship, we're going to worship Yahweh, and that's good, but just in case Yahweh doesn't come through, 
all right? We want to have these other gods that we can go to on the side. We want to have our Baal temple. We want to have our Ashra temple. We want to go over here and be sure that we're worshiping the sun, just in case Yahweh doesn't come through. The sun might come through for us, right? So it was this collection of gods. And this is one thing that from the very beginning, God said, no, 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 no. You can't have any other God before me. And this was Israel's problem. And it led to the downfall of both kingdoms, both the north and the south. And it was a, it was a terrible tragedy that could have been avoided. And so the thing that I want us to talk about today, because idolatry has not left us, right? We, all, we still have this issue, it's this, this temptation. And I'm going to talk about that at the end, but before we get there, I want to talk about ways in which Deuteronomy addresses this problem. And I want to do it in a positive way, because Deuteronomy has a lot of very positive things to say about how do we live with God so that we don't fall into this trap, right? It's much better, right, not to have fallen into the trap than to fall into the trap and have to dig yourself out, right? <laughs> right? So if we can keep from falling in the ditch in the first place, right, then that's a whole lot better than trying to dig ourselves out. And so what are these things that Deuteronomy teaches us these ancient words that Moses spoke to the people, what are these words that speak to us today? Well, the first one has to do with hearing and remembering. And I'll just go down the list and we'll go back and talk about each one. Um, the principle of Sabbath, the, uh, the idea of celebration, warnings, and the last one, which is the idea that we have a choice to make. So let's start with the first one. If we look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'll have this up on the screen, but if you'd like to follow along in the Bible, I have the scriptures up that you can read those uh, as well. There is something called uh, the Shema, which means the hearing. And it's a sort of a title that's given to this very famous passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And let's read it together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your might. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away and when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. All right, this is one of the very first things that Moses, in Deuteronomy, that Moses said to the people. And this is the first real safeguard against falling into idolatry. So let's talk about these three things. Your heart, your soul, and your might, and what these might be mean. In the ancient world, when we talk about the heart, we're talking about the center of the will, right? Now, in our contemporary society, when we talk about the heart, a lot of times we are talking about feelings, right? The, the heart is associated with feelings. But in the, in the Old Testament and in the world that Moses was speaking into, the heart had to do with the will, what we will to do, the choices that we make. And with the exception of the Psalms, and I think this is kind of interesting, and again, I'm putting the Psalms kind of in a separate category, but as you're reading through um, the Israelite scriptures, you don't really read that much about how, how people feel about things. It's really not so much about what you're feeling, it's what decisions are you making that becomes really important. And so to love God with all of your heart means you love God with your will. We choose to follow God. We choose to walk with God. We choose to put God first. We choose to put God on the throne. We choose to put God as king, 
right? And sometimes that may feel good, and sometimes that may not feel good at all. But it's not about how we feel about it, right? It's the choice that we make. And I think that is something that can speak into our culture and our times in a really powerful way. Because what happens when your life is governed about how you feel about things? Right? You know how this works, right? You're up one day and down the next, right? And you're on this perpetual kind of spiritual roller coaster, right? And, and God's presence with us is equated to whether or not we feel like God is with us or we feel like God has abandoned us because we feel that way, right? Rather than having a decision that we've made that we're going to stick with God come, you know, through thick and thin. It's a decision that we make. We love God with all of our heart, with all of our decision-making ability. The soul, um, the, the Hebrew word that's translated as soul, has to do with our, our being, our des the desiring part of our being. What do we want? And this is a timeless question um, about living on this earth as human beings. It's a simple question, but it's a profound one. It's a deep one. What do you want? Right? At the end of the day, what do we want? Do we want God or not? Do we desire to be close to God or not? And so when Moses is encouraging the people of Israel, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and all of your soul he's saying love the Lord your God with all of your will with your decision-making ability and love the Lord and desire to be close to God right have God as your desire right and the last one love God with all of your might has to do with everything else about you right kind of your your excess right and I, and I think about this as uh, think about the times when you got really excited about something. When you were, you know, when you were jumping up and down, when you were showing, you know, a lot of your emotion, that which you don't normally show every single day, but it's something that is in excess, right? It's your, it's, it could be your strength, sometimes the translations say that. It can be your might. But the word actually has to do with everything else, right? Everything about you. And so, He's saying, you know, love the Lord your God with your decision making. Love the Lord your God with your desire and with everything else that you love the Lord, right? That excludes nothing. There's nothing that's left out of those three. So the encouragement from the outset is make God your all. Make God everything, right? And grow towards that, he's saying. Now, how do we do that well he goes on to say to keep the words of god right to recite them to your children to talk about them to bind them on your hands to fix them as an emblem to write them on the doorpost this is a very descriptive way of saying don't let god ever be far from you right to the extent that you're able right to talk about it talk about it with your children pass it on to the next generation when you're getting up when you're walking when you're eating when you're uh, whatever it is you're doing you know keep god in front of you on your doorpost right write it on your doorpost right it's this sort of build up of images which is saying make be have god infused in all parts of your life right now this is the initial instruction to, instruction to Israel about how to stay close to God on the journey. But is this not the same thing that we need? Do we not need this now, <laughs> right? To choose to follow God, right? To desire to be with God and to talk about our relationship with God, to pass this on to our children. Um, that following God should be something that permeates our whole being as we walk it's why we need each other isn't it right it's why we assemble it's why we talk with each other it's why we have class and we we come to church and we get together right today even it's to be reminded so that we don't forget right because when we don't do these things we forget right 
and then the drift starts to happen. So the next thing is the idea of remembering, right? And remembering is a sort of the second thing that permeates Deuteronomy. The very fact that Deuteronomy exists, right? Deuteronomy is the second telling of the law is to remind. It's to say again. Because if there's one thing that we all know, all of us know this, <laughs> that is characteristic of being human is that if we're not reminded what happens we forget right and the the older i get the easier it is to forget right we just forget it's not we don't mean to forget but we just forget right and so we need to be reminded there is a if, if you ever have a chance to go to jerusalem and to go to the memorial the holocaust memorial in jerusalem um, called Yad Vashem, or the hand of, of God, um, there is an inscription as you walk in. If you've, if you've seen the movie Schindler's List, part of it, a lot of it was the, at the end, was filmed there. But there is a, a quotation from a rabbi that says um, that remembrance is the secret to redemption and that forgetfulness is the path to exile. And this is, this harkens back to the Deuteronomic idea that when the children of Israel forgot God, what was the result historically? Exile, right? Had they remembered, had they practiced remembering, then exile could have been avoided. And so in the book of Deuteronomy, there is a repetition of the Ten Commandments. And at the center of the Ten Commandments is the reminder of Sabbath. And I wanted to talk just a little bit about that as we have opportunity to do tonight. And let's read this together. It is in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. And I think it's notable that if you look at the structure of the Ten Commandments, if you just look at it on the page, right, from commandment one all the way down to commandment 10, the largest chunk of that in terms of amount said is the commandment on Sabbath, right? It, it takes up more space and there's more to say about Sabbath than there are these other commandments. And that has to do with its importance. And so what does he say? And let's just take a look at, at, at that. He says, Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male or female slave, or your ox or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Okay? So... The Sabbath day, the Sabbath means to stop, right? So the Sabbath day is, is a day of stopping. And it's a day of stopping that happens after you've worked for six days, right? You work for six days, you stop. You work for another six days, you stop, right? So there's a rhythm to our walking with God. There is a rhythm to living with God. And the way this is uh, laid out for Israel in the book of Deuteronomy is that every seven days we're supposed to stop. So that Sabbath and remembering to keep the Sabbath functions as an interruption of the daily grind. Okay, so Sabbath is, um, it's a practice of interrupting this daily routine that we're in. And so, you know, all of us know this, that what happens when we just work all the time and we never take a break? What happens when all we do is work day in, day out, and we never stop, right? 
One of the things, there's many things that happen. One is burnout, another one is health issues, another one is broken relationships. <laughs> we could just go on and on about not what happens when we don't take a break, but what happens is that, one of the things that happens is that our focus becomes very narrow. All we think about is work, and everything that doesn't fit into that daily grind is edited out. And so when we have a practice of never stopping, then God gets edited out along with all the rest of it, right? And so our lives become gradually, maybe not overnight, but our lives gradually become all about work. And we, like we were talking about earlier, if we don't remember what happens, we forget, right? So notice how this commandment in Deuteronomy, how it's worded. There's the commandment to keep the Sabbath, but then it says, well, why, why do that? Well, it's so that you can remember who God is, right? Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and God is the one who brought you out, okay? This practice of stopping is so that Israel will have this practice of remembering who God is, what God did, and who's the one who blesses, right? So if we work all the time, eventually we get to thinking that, well, it's my work that blesses me, right? I mean, I'm doing all the work, I'm, you know, and, and I'm the one that is in charge of blessing. But God doesn't, didn't want Israel thinking that. He says, I want you to remember that I'm the one who blessed you, right? Remember that God brought you out. He is the one, right, who is leading you to the, to the promised land with an outstretched arm and a mighty hand, right? So keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not just for the day itself it is for israel's spiritual life and so what does that mean for us well it means that we need a a a practice of interrupting our daily grind whatever that may look like for us today certainly our worship times together on the first day of the week are that and there are many other ways perhaps that that could be infused into our life um, but we need times of daily stopping to focus on God, because if we don't do that, then what, hap what will happen to us is what, hap what happened to Israel, right? Just gradually over time, we fall away, and the result of that is not good, right? It's our own kind of exile. The next thing that comes up, and this is really rather unusual because it, it's, it's a bit unexpected, um, but it's this practice of tithing. Um, in the Old Testament, I think what we mostly think of from tithing is this 10% that was to be given by God on agricultural produce. And we've got references in Genesis to it. We also have laws governing the tithe in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's uh, not necessarily something that we think a whole lot about, although we do um, perhaps occasionally, but Deuteronomy's treatment of the tithe is in the context of remembering who we are, remembering who God is, and remembering who the people are that God wants us to pay attention to. And I would direct your attention to Deuteronomy 14, and we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but particularly in verses 22 to 28 is the, the purpose of the tithe according to Deuteronomy. And I, I, will direct, I will direct your attention to the last two verses, right, of Deuteronomy 14, verse 28 through 29. Every third year you shall bring out the full tithe of your produce for that year and store it within your towns. The Levites, because they have no allotment or inheritance with you, as well as the resident aliens, the orphans and the widows in your towns may come and eat their fill so that the Lord your God may bless you 
in all that the work that you undertake. And so the tithe was not simply a gift to God, but it was a means of bringing that part of our produce to share with others who had need. But in so doing, it was also a reminder that God is the one who blesses. And I think this is, is something that um, God wanted Israel to see, that it's, it's, it's not because of their effort that they're being led to a promised land. It's not because of their work or their worth, or it, it's not because of them. God is the one doing this. God is the one blessing. And it's the same that's true with us today. God is the one who blesses us. And in Deuteronomy, the, this practice of the tithe was ultimately to remember that, to remember that all people can come and receive a blessing from God um, if we remember and, and practice that, which um, is what... And what's interesting about tithing is that you don't really, we don't really read a lot in the stories of the Old Testament that follow, right? If we look at Joshua, Judges, and the Kings, we don't really read that much about tithing. We don't really know whether Israel practiced that or not. Um, when we get into Ezra and Nehemiah, there is a bit of a revival of that. Um, but there's always this practice uh, in Israel that, that seems to be... Um, very self-centered, right? We want to create our own destiny. We want to uh, make our own blessings. And these laws that God pu puts out that Moses reminds the people of in Deuteronomy are, are ultimately to remind that God is the one who blesses, not them. So um, <clears throat> God also deals with idolatry uh, through warnings about uh, idolatry and, and it's it's so significant uh, that it comes up in several places in Deuteronomy 12, Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18 and I always ask my students when we get to the to this section in Deuteronomy it's like what is so what is so bad about witchcraft and all of these idolatrous practices uh, that they are to uh, avoid what is it that why does God have such a problem with this? If, if, if God is God and God alone, right? We heard that in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is God alone. Then is God threatened by us going around and, and toying with these other deities or these other practices? And I think one of the things that, that we can say about this is that it's not that idolatry threatens God, but it's when we go looking for power in other places. When we leave the one who has the ability to bless and we decide, we will to decide that, you know what, I just don't think God's coming through today. So I'm going to go over here to this shrine, or I'm going to go over here to this medium, or I'm going to go over to this other spiritual entity over here, and I'm going to see what I can get from that, because I don't trust God anymore, <laughs> or maybe not today. That's what's wrong with it, right? It's, it's forsaking God, thinking that there's power somewhere else, when for Israel what was right in front of them was the deliverance from Egypt, deliverance from slavery by the mighty hand of God. I mean, they had the proof, right? God has proved it to them, but yet they decided to trust in something else. And so these warnings that happen throughout Deuteronomy, there's, there's a big section in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, that is a list of blessings and cursings. There are, I think, 63 verses, a big, big chapter in Deuteronomy 28. If you venture to guess, how many of those have to do with blessing and how many of those have to do with cursing, right? Having to do with 
we are blessed if we keep the law of God, but if we don't keep the law of God and we go somewhere else, then there is a price to pay for that, right? Only 14 of those 60 some odd verses have to do with blessing. The rest have to do with cursing. And that was horrifying to me when I first <laughs> realized that. I thought, shouldn't that be reversed? I mean, shouldn't God be talking to us all the time about how much he's going to bless us? But that's, but the inverse is the reality of it. And I think it goes to show that we are, as, as human beings, we're so prone to choose the wrong thing. It's just part of being human, right? I was talking with my class, we were starting the, the Pentateuch today, and, and in my class and we were getting into those early chapters in Genesis and we were we were reflecting on you know how long does it take humanity to go off track after we're created right we're created by God in Genesis 1 and 2 and by Genesis 4 humans are murdering each other Ugh. <laughs> I mean and by Genesis 5 and 6 God's saying you know what I don't know this is a good idea and we get the flood right and God has to start over I mean we are just so prone, we are so prone as human beings to will the wrong thing. And so, hence this very direct, strong, loving but strong direction in the book of Deuteronomy, right? You have to stay on track, right? We have to put God first. And so, um, I know our time is almost up, but I wanted to, to close with... Deuteronomy 30, which is the, towards the end of <clears throat> uh, Moses' uh, lesson, final lesson to the people of God. And I wanted to call your attention to Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 uh, through 20, where he says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses choose life so that you and your descendants may live loving the Lord your God obeying him and holding fast to him for that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob I love this verse. I mean, this is, I call this a refrigerator verse. I mean, you know, put it on the refrigerator and you can see it every day, right? That God sets before us two ways. God set before Israel two ways. He sets before us the same two ways, right? To follow him or not. To choose him or not, right? And we love to think, right? This is part of our human humanity. We love to think that there's like a third way right we can kind of love God and kind of not right we sort of want to carve our own path but Moses leaves the children of Israel with a very clear picture right here today I set before you life and death adversity and prosperity right choose life choose God choose blessing because when we make that choice, right, it goes back to the hero Israel, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your decision-making ability. When we choose God, that means life to us. And isn't that what we want, right? Isn't what we really want is to live in the days that God has given us, to live them to the fullest measure. Isn't that what we want? It is. Right? And so the, the path seems clear. It's not simple, but it's clear, right? Choose God. Don't choose something else, right? These other paths don't work. Choose to focus on God. Choose to make God the one who is up front and center in our life. And it's a daily choice, isn't it? Right? A daily choice when we get up, it's like, Lord, teach me today what you want me to do. Right? Just like Israel, we're, we're really no different than that. It still speaks very powerfully into how we order our living. Right? If we wake up in the morning and say, God, you've granted me the peace, you've given me a new day, help me to make good choices. 
Help me to choose you. Show me what that looks like. Teach me what it looks like. Show me where the wrong path is I may be tempted to take. But I want with my whole heart to follow you, so help me do that. And God is faithful, yes? God is faithful, right? God was faithful to Israel even though they got off track. He is faithful to us in the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, who is, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, <laughs> right? We can, we can trust him. So second bell, but I would like to uh, pray with us and then we'll be, we'll be finished. So would you pray with me, please? Lord, thank you for this, for your word. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for preserving this ancient text that is so timeless and speaks to us so powerfully in 2018. Thank you for the way that you are with us and that you guide us. Thank you for the choice that you give us. And Lord, as we go from this place, help us to make the right choices. Help us to choose you and to choose life. And in Jesus' name, amen.